If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to Acts chapter 19. You get stuff out of the way. <clears throat> We've been praying for a move of God's Spirit, not just in our church, but in our community. I and some other pastors have been praying. And I think sometimes, that, you know, we pray for God to move, but when He does move, we kind of scratch our heads and wonder what, what to do with it. Uh, but the early church... I believe that when they, when they went into, when the Apostle Paul or one of the other early apostles would go into a city, they would expect God to do something. We've got to expect God to do something. And if, 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 we're, if we're not, then I, I, sometimes it almost feels like we need to take the lid off of things. <laughs> you ever put a lid on something? You know, you'll go so far and say, well, that's enough. But I never want to have too much of God. I never want to have too much of God. In Acts chapter 19, we read about the Apostle Paul passing through a city named Ephesus. Starting at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now, the Apostle Paul, to put this in context, this was on his second missionary journey. Okay, He took four journeys, considered missionary journeys. And he, uh, he was returning back. This was on like the, the, back, the backward swing of his second journey. And he came to a city called Ephesus. Now, uh, if you... Look at a map, and if you have a Bible, they usually have maps in the back. Ephesus would have been located in what today is Turkey. He was in Greece. He was in Athens and Macedonia and Athens and Corinth, down in the, in the peninsula there at the bottom of Greece. And he sailed across the uh, Adriatic Sea to go to, or the Aegean Sea, to go to Turkey. And he went to this place called Ephesus, and he found certain disciples. Now, now these men that he found were disciples. They were believers. They were saved. And he asked them this question. He said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, Holy Ghost? What's that? <laughs> you know, they, they didn't know. By the way, if you're reading a, a newer version, this, this, in the King James they used Holy Ghost. When we think of ghost, we think like Casper, the friendly ghost. Forget about that. <laughs> it's a spirit, Holy Spirit. How many people believe there's a spiritual realm? We live in a natural realm, but there's a spiritual realm. I thank God that the spiritual realm has a lot to do with the natural realm. And not everything that is spiritual is holy, by the way. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's a lot of other kinds of spirits. There are angels who are ministering spirits. Then there are fallen angels. And the chief of the fallen angels is a guy named... Lucifer, his name was originally Lucifer, now they, we call him Satan, or the devil. He's, he's a spirit too. We've got to watch that. There's spiritual things going on all the time. The Bible says to test the spirits, John wrote in his first letter, try the spirits. When, when there's spiritual stuff going on, check them out. And how do we check them out? We check them out by our Bible. <laughs> okay. It went crooked on me. Okay, come on back. Okay. All right. All right. Now. Or our Bible. If, you know, if you're not savvy like me, electronically savvy. Okay. All right. Okay. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not so much as heard. Will there be any Holy Ghost? We haven't even heard about the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Now, we believe in baptism. We believe that if a person gets saved, they ought to be baptized in water by immersion. Because that's what Jesus said. Baptism does not save you. Can't save you. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an act of obedience. There are people that get saved without being baptized and go to heaven. 
But baptism is an important act that we get saved uh, by uh, faith in Christ, and we show that through baptism. So Paul asked these, uh, these believers, uh, how were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized with John the Baptist. Remember him? All the way back in the early parts of the Gospels. John the Baptist baptized people under repentance. Then said Paul, in verse 4, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, again, baptism doesn't save you, and it doesn't matter what words you use necessarily. Some people believe you have to be baptized, and the guy baptized, and he has to say the right words, and if they don't say the right words, then you're not going to be... You know, I mean, do you think God, when you stand before God, he's going to ask you what the guy said when he baptized you? That's not... We're, we're saved by faith, which is on the inside. Not by the words that the guy says. Some people teach you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Some say, well, no, it has to be in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, use both of them. It, it, it's not a, the, important the words you say. It's, what, it's the faith that a person has in the blood of Jesus. That's what saves us. Baptism doesn't save us. The preacher doesn't save us. It's Christ who saved us on the cross. So he baptized them. It says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. These were believers. They were saved before they were baptized by Paul. But here's the point I want to look at. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and what happened? They spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, now today, there's some folks that say that's speaking in tongues. That's for, that's for back then. You know, they did uh, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, he spoke with tongues, right? The Spirit came, spoke with tongues. Some people said that was a one-shot deal. But this was years later. And these guys got baptized. There were nobody. There were just 12, or it says about 12 believers. And they got baptized, and they, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what are we saying? When we talk about revival, and we're going to look at this chapter about, we're going to analyze revival that happened in the city of Ephesus. It began with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These 12 nondescript, we don't even know their names. It says there's about 12 of them. We don't even know exactly how many there were. It doesn't matter. But God poured His Spirit out. And he began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Just like, you know, a sister prophesied here. She spoke a word from God. And, you know, she didn't know who it was for, but God did. Maybe it was for somebody else in here too. But she spoke that word. That's, you know, we, God works in his people. The whole idea of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. So these men, when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, started speaking in tongues and prophesying. And they probably was acting up a little bit because it got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, what happened? It says that Paul, in verse 8, went into the synagogue. We're going to talk about the anatomy of a revival. It begins with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. You know, you can work up spiritual stuff. I've been doing this long enough, and some of you have been doing this long enough, that you've been places where they try to shout it up, scream it up, dance it up, or whatever. You know, people try to work up things. But listen to what he said. What it says here. Spirit was poured out. And what did Paul do? He went into the synagogue in verse 8 and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He went first to the Jews in Ephesus because Paul was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He's the Jewish Messiah. And the gospel goes to the Jew first and then the Greek. So he went to the Jews first. He went to the synagogue. And you know what happened in that synagogue? He went there for, what did it say, three weeks? He went there, or three months rather. He went there disputing and persuading. You know what? They eventually threw him out. Because they didn't like to hear what he had to say. One thing, when God starts pouring out his spirit, and when God starts moving amongst the people, those who are hardened and entrenched in religion will say, ain't for me. We never did it like that. That's not the way. That's not the way I was brought up. You know, my church teaches. We teach, and and we all. You know, every church has their little set of things that they teach, and they they grab onto. Oh, we don't want that. We don't want that Holy Spirit stuff around here. We don't want that talking times around. We don't want to see people. I don't want no sinners in my church. Let me go somewhere else. You know, and. So Paul went to the synagogue because that's where he was used to going. He would go to the synagogue. He preached. 
he disputed, he persuaded. And Paul, remember, was a rabbi. At one time, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. So Paul was very educated in the things of the Jews. Matter of fact, he said at one time he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So that's where he went. And they received him for three months. Verse 9, But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spoke evil of that way before the multitude. I'll tell you what, if a revival starts happening, there are going to be people bad-mouthing it. As sure as anything, if it's, if it's a Holy Ghost revival. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. He went out and he rented himself a, a room, a building, and he began teaching God's Word. Verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. When a revival comes, it will be accompanied by teaching and preaching of God's word. See, there's a lot of stuff happening that's called revival, but there's no preaching or teaching of God's word. If the word isn't preached and taught, you're not going to know what spirit it is. You could, you could experience a spiritual thing. And man, I mean, people, you know... They claim to be floating and everything else. I, you know, but if, if the God's word isn't preached and taught, how do you know it's coming from God? It has everything, everything, all the gifts of the Spirit have to be accompanied by the preaching and teaching of God's word. So that people understand what's going on. Paul said in Corinthians, if somebody walks in your church and stuff has happened and people don't understand, they'll just think you're all crazy. But all this stuff has a, has a purpose, has a reason. God ministering to his people. So the word went forth, and this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. If a revival happens, it doesn't stay in one room. It goes out. You can't keep it in. If the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and, and the Holy Spirit's inside a body, you can't keep it in. I always get a kick of these folks who try to teach other people how to talk in tongues. Come on, have you ever... You know, say, you know, put, put like, you know, syllables together. I told somebody one time, I said, you know what, if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, nobody, they won't be able to shut you up. Nobody has to tell you to start moving your mouth because your mouth will be moving if it's the Holy Ghost. All right? It's just the word will go forth. Okay? Now, verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. When a revival happens, God will do things out of the ordinary. He'll do things for people that you can't even imagine could be done. And we read about these special miracles. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. But Paul was a tent maker, because he worked also and, and preached. And what they would do is when he would take you know, a rag that he would wipe his sweat with, somebody would take that and lay it on somebody, and they'd be healed. Special miracles. There's nothing in the Bible that, that has, you know, that is a gift of the Spirit, you know, a, a healing rag ministry, okay. Although some folks have tried to do that because, you know, they can send them out and you send them money, you know, send them a healing. Okay, they'll make, you know, a healing cloth ministry, right? You know, a point of contact, uh, yeah, you know. It was a special miracle. God can do things out of the ordinary. Now we hear about things happening in churches, you know, and people like, you know, like gold teeth and stuff like this. Hey, you know what? I'm, I, I, I want to know what word's being preached. That's right. yeah. If the word's being preached, people are getting saved. Well, God can do anything he wants to. He's God. Right. Right. See, I'm, I'm very careful about dissing things before I find out what's going on. When you do find out what's going on, you can do Okay? <laughs> because a lot of times you find out about that stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah. But... If, if, you know, if, 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 if preaching is going on and people are getting saved and lives are being changed, that's the bottom line. God can confirm it any way he wants to. But the bottom line is the word is preached and the word is taught and people leave understanding what God's purpose for their life is, understanding what God's word is, his redemptive plan. The Bible is not a mystery. It's an explanation. Special miracles, power that brings... And, and, and effect power that brings a change power that can take New Kensington and, and, and change people so that the violence and the shooting stuff I'm tired of hearing about shootings in New Kensington there's got to be a power of God that can change lives to bring a stop to the violence and a stop to the foolishness that's going on in this city it's a revival now look, read on with me a little bit more we're going to see another things that happen with revival. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, there were folks there in Ephesus who were religious, who were, who were 
just kind of wanderers. They called themselves Jews, but here it calls them vagabond Jews. They were exorcists. Remember that movie? Yeah. With the lady with the head turned around? <laughs> exorcists? That's one when I used to watch movies. <laughs> okay. That was an old one. They were exorcists. They, they advertised themselves as people that would cast out devils. They weren't Christians. They didn't know about the Holy Ghost. They, they were just, they were like religious folks. Okay, now listen. They took upon them uh, to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So now, whenever you have a revival, whenever things start happening and God starts moving, there will be the imitators. There will be the people that will try to cash in on what's going on. Because some folks have found out that Religious sensitivities can bring in a lot of cash, okay? So when they find out that there's a religious thing going on, and it's been going on, you can turn on your TV. I turned, I was flicking through the channels. There was a guy there, you know, send your, you know, $100. You know, if you can't afford a 1000 send 100 and if you can't. And, and oh, you know, God will bless you and everything. They found out that if you, if you touch the right religious buttons in a person's spirit and soul, that now you can garner, you can get a lot of, okay? So these, these vagabond Jews, they're seven, seven sons of Sceva, uh, a, a, a Jew and a chief of the priest, they went to a fellow and they figured, well, we'll cast an evil spirit out by the name of Jesus. It's working for them. It'll probably work for us too. Do you know there are people that teach that principles found in the scripture will work even if you're not saved? Yeah, you know, you can get rich, you can be successful, you can have power, you can have, you know, it, you can bypass Jesus, you can bypass the cross, but there's these principles. You know, if you give, you'll get it. And if you, yeah, yeah. So these, these seven sons of Sceva, they figured, hey, the name of Jesus works for them. We'll just, we'll just, you know, lay it out, right? So, they went to this man and cast the evil spirit out in the name of Jesus. And the evil spirit answered. The spirits speak, okay? Evil spirits speak too. Okay. They said, Jesus, I know who he is. You know the devil knows who Jesus is? He knows him real well. <laughs> he knows him real well. He says, I know Jesus. And Paul, I know, I know him. I know Paul. You know what? If you're, if you're born again, Satan knows who you are. If you're born again, I want you to get a hold of this. If you're born again, you can cause Satan headaches. You know that? If you know what you're doing? If, if you understand that? Okay, now, listen. He says, I know Jesus. And I know Paul. But who are you? You know, what right? You know, folks think that just because you use the name, you have the right to go up against devils. I'll tell you one thing. Don't you go up against any devils unless you know that's what God has called you to do. Unless, because they're, they're nasty. All right? Now listen. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. See, when, when they tried, then the imitators tried to use the name of Jesus just to get something accomplished and make a few bucks, they ended up getting beat up. See, this is why when, when we talk about the spiritual gifts and we talk about make sure, make sure it's the Holy Spirit. Because if, if it's the wrong spirit, you could end up getting beat up physically and spiritually. All right? It's important. This is why the Word has to accomplish, uh, accompany every spiritual manifestation. There has to be preaching and teaching in the Word so you know what's right. And so you know what's wrong. Because I don't want to get messed up with the wrong spirit. There have been a few times I've allowed myself to dabble in here or there, places where I shouldn't be. I can remember old Pastor Spencer. He used to warn me all the time. I'd say, Pastor Spencer, I think I'm going to go and visit this Bible study over here in such and such church. And he'd say, oh, brother, you better cover yourself with the blood. He would tell you, you better watch out. Because not everything that calls itself holy is holy. All right? Now, you have the impersonators. Okay, you have the, the proclamation of God's word, you have the rejection by the establishment, you have the word going forth, you have special miracles and God doing, doing things. You see people getting saved and, and uh, uh, acceptance by the lost. And look with me now in these next few verses. In verse uh, 17. And this was known, speaking of the seven sons of Sceva, this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Fear fell on them because they said, man, we better know what we're doing. Okay. Now, look what he says in verse 18. And many that believed, okay, now, there's a revival, people are hearing, Gentiles are hearing the word of God, and they're believing, and they're getting saved. Now listen, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. When a true revival comes, there will be the power of God to bring 
changes in the lives of sinners. Sinners being saved. That's what it's all about. Sinners being saved. It's about nothing else. All the stuff that goes along with it is just like kind of collateral stuff. You know, we fellowship, we come to church, we fellowship with one another, we pray and sing and corporate worship, we have meals and we have prayer time, and those things are great. But it's all for the purpose. Everything works together. The purpose of the body of the Christ is to bring forth the Word of God to a lost and dying world. And if people aren't getting saved, then maybe the, 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 the emphasis, maybe the focus is wrong. We've got to pray for salvation. We've got to pray for people to come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Whether they come to this church or some other church, we've got to pray for salvation because that's what it's all about. And when people come to know Jesus, their lives will change. See, the thing that grieves my heart is there's a lot of people that tell me they have come to know the Lord Jesus, but their lives haven't changed. How can you come to the cross, how can you be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and not have your life changed? How can that be? Here's how it can be. We've presented a gospel that's a, you know, like a Mr. Rogers gospel, right? You're special. You're being special. You're being special. special. <laughs> God knows my, Jesus, God knows my heart. How many, how many times have you heard that? See, God does know our heart. That's the problem. He knows. It's our heart is wicked above all things. He does know my heart. When I, when I turn my back on Him and I do things that are displeasing to Him, He knows that I'm in the flesh. That's my heart. He knows my heart is wicked. If I lean to my heart, I'm going to do the wrong thing every time. My heart will lead me down the path to destruction. That's why I need the Spirit. Because He'll lead me in the path of righteousness. So their, their lives will change. Many of them... Uh, 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 many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. They came and they owned up to, to the life they were living. They owned up to the stuff they were doing. They didn't try to justify. They didn't try to blame somebody else. They didn't try to blame mom and dad. They didn't get hypnotized and get, you know, all these things. They, they, they just came up and said, I'm a sinner. I'm an adulterer. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a whatever. They were. And they came and they confessed that because confession is good to the soul. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm not talking about getting in that little room I used to have to get in when I was a kid and, and saying, oh, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I'm not dealing with that. I'm talking about confessing to God our sins and saying, this is what I was. I was a drug addict. I was a sex addict. I was this. I was that. I was that. Whatever. Fill in the blank. We confess it and bring it to the Lord and He cleanses us and makes us new creatures. Now this is, if revival happens, people will start coming and crying out and saying, God, I'm a sinner. Save me. They'll own up to who they are. And in verse 19 it says this. Look at this. This is a good one. I like this. Many of them also which use curious arts. <laughs> curious arts. Soothsayers, witches, witchcraft, sorcery. They brought their books together and they burned them before all men. They had a book burning. Now, I'm not, listen, I don't think we should go and burn books. Hitler did that in World War II. He burned all the books that didn't agree with him, okay? But this, this, that's not what this was about. This was about people that used to have books. And, and I, I, you know, I can remember before I was saved, and I've told this story, you've, you've known a story. I used to be, a, I, I collected records, the big black round things that they, they used to have. And when I got saved, God said, you need to get rid, they were my idols. I got rid of them. I didn't sell them. I destroyed them. I had lots of them. Because God told me to do it. Not that I think we should go out and raid records, or now CD stores, <laughs> and burn stuff. That's not, that's not up to us. But, but the stuff, the books that they burned here, it wasn't they like went into libraries and burned. Bur they were burning their own personal things they used to use to worship some devil. In other words, they were cleaning their houses. 
They were cleaning their lives. They were cleansing all the junk that they had because God changed their life and they realized they could no longer worship those demons. They could no longer uh, bow down to, 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 those, to those devils. So they took all the stuff that they used to read. I used to have books on astrology. Anybody ever have a good book on astrology? Books on astrology. I used to have books about reincarnation because I was into that. You know, I was into all that stuff. And I, got, and I got all that stuff. When I got saved, I says, I got to get this stuff out of my house and in the garbage because that's where it belongs. That's what they did. Many of them, brought, which is curious arts, brought their books together, burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them, found it was 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. Okay. So, now look, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So we see this revival going on. We see lives being changed. We see people getting rid of the old stuff that they used to hold dear, the, uh, the old gods and the things that they, they used to think were important. And they're, and they're getting rid of it. They're confessing. They're repenting. They're cleaning up their houses. And we see the word going forth in power. We see people getting saved. The word of God prevailed, it says. Prevailed. God, help the word of God prevail in our city. The, the, the more and more in our culture, we keep hearing people trying to put down the Word of God. You know what? The Word of God can prevail in the United States of America. And I don't care who's in the White House or who's in the Congress or who's on the Supreme Court. The Word of God is greater than all that. But what, it takes is, what it's going to take is a revival in the church, the body of Christ. So when we stop playing with all this foolishness and let there be a true repentance and salvation. Okay? Now, there's one more step. Verse 21. You see, I'm praying for revival. I know we're praying for revival in our church, in our city. Well, these are things that we can expect. Look at verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit that he, uh, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent the Macedonian uh, to them that ministered unto him. Uh, drop down to verse 23. And the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. See that in verse 23? When all this stuff is going on, listen, when the Word of God goes forth, when lives are being changed, when people burn their, their old stuff that they don't want to worship with anymore, when they get rid of all the old stuff that used to bind them, and, 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 and there's a change, it'll bring a change in the lives of individuals, it'll bring a change in the culture, a change in the society, and don't you know that is going to cause a stir? Because evil is a big business. When, when people turn from evil, the people that profit off of evil lose their profit. So what happened here? For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. Now if you study and read about the city of Ephesus, Ephesus was the center of the worship of the goddess Diana, or Artemis was another name for her. It was, a, it was a goddess that was like a many, if you see a picture, many-breasted, supposedly a meteor fell uh, at one time, and they thought it was from the gods, and they called this the goddess Diana. There was a great temple in Ephesus that was one of the wonders of the world at that time to the goddess Diana. And needless to say, and again, like religious things, it was very profitable for those who were able to make silver shrines and silver you know, uh, dashboard statues, you know, and the things, they have dashboards back then, but you know what I'm saying. Everybody has these little religious artifacts that they hang, okay. And, and uh, the, the, their, their profits started drying up because all these people started getting saved, and they don't want that stuff no more. So Demetrius made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain to the craftsmen, whom he called together with a workman of like occupation. He called a union meeting and said, Sirs, you know, we make money off of this craft. <laughs> Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost all throughout all Asia. This Paul has persuaded and turned much people, saying that they be no more gods, which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. This guy's messing with our pocketbooks. When revival comes, you're going to mess with people's pocketbooks. The Word of God going forth, people confessing and repenting and crying out for forgiveness and asking God to change their lives. They're going to stop spending their money on nonsense in the bar rooms, in the casinos, in the, in the prostitutes, in the drug dealers, 
all of a sudden their money dries up. Do you think they're going to sit by? You know, if we have a true revival in Arnold New Kensington, what do you think is going to happen? with the Cleveland boys and the Detroit boys and the other boys is around here selling stuff and the girls at Donald Constant Boulevard and all this other stuff that we see. What do you think is going to happen when the, money, when the money starts drying up? There'll be trouble. Let's just read what happened. Verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord unto the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples said, No, Paul, you don't want to go in there. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself to the theater. Uh, some therefore cried one thing, and another cried, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew what, uh, wherefore that, that they were come together. Most of them didn't even know why they were there. Like Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> they don't even know why they're there. This looks like fun to camp out in the middle of the city and get high and whatever. Okay. <laughs> I, I said this before. If I was like I was when I was a teenager, I'd be with Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> I would, but I'm, but I'm not like that anymore. I got saved. All right. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews putting him forward. Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. Verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out. I mean, this is great as Diana of the Ephesians. And we had this big riot going on in the, in the amphitheater there in Ephesus. Because they were losing money because God's word was prevailing. See, that'll happen. When God's word prevails, sin begins to diminish. Evil is assaulted. We need to learn, listen, we need to take the lid off and start assaulting evil in our community by the word of God. That doesn't mean go out, you know, with guns where, you know, where the drug dealers are and threaten them. That doesn't mean that. That means by praying in the spirit, by being filled with the Holy Ghost, we go right back to the very beginning of this revival. It happened with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to embolden us and to empower us and to give us everything we need to be able to stand against the evil that's going on in our city. I believe that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to see a difference in Arnold and New Kensington. I grew up here. And I see a difference from when I was. And here's what, here's what you hear all the time. For those of you that you know what you, know what you hear. I heard this. When we, we, uh, we, just, we were able to get a new van for the church, you know. So we went to the, to the uh, notary. Uh, uh, this was on Route 8. And a lady who was a notary, she said, oh, you're from New Kensington. I said, yeah. She says, oh, I used to, hang, I used to have relatives that lived there, and we used to go there when I was a kid, and we used to go down. She says, oh, it's no good anymore. I, says, I said, well, you know, it's kind of gone downhill a little bit. And she said, well, yeah. She said, I remember when, I remember when the mob ran. <laughs> now, come on. For those of you who have been around here long enough, I've lived here all my life. And we always heard that. Oh, the mob, they take care of things. Yeah, yeah, the manorinos. And it, you know. You know why it's like it is now? It's because, not, it's because for years, for decades, the, the leaders, quote-unquote leaders of the city, depended on the mob to run things. So when the aluminum company left, and the money left, and the mob left, they were sitting there saying, what do we do now? No moral compass. If there would have been righteousness running the city of New Kensington for all those years instead of the Manorinos, maybe we would have been able to recover from what happened here. But instead of righteousness running it, it was unrighteousness and sin running it. And people think that sin, you know, as long as we're making money, sin is okay. Listen, sin, you cannot exalt a nation with sin. You cannot exalt a city with sin. And when sin runs things, you end up with what we have now. It's time that God's word starts to prevail in our city. And it has to prevail with an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I'm so tired of hearing that. Oh, in the mob, Brandon. I want to see a mob. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not just for in here, but so we can go out. Because that's where the power... 
you know, we, I thank God for the power. I thank God He can encourage us. Just like this morning, God spoke a word and the person was encouraged and built up. That's part of the body of Christ. That's the way the body's supposed to function. But when we take that and take it out to where they need to hear, they need to hear that if they die in their sins, they're going to spend eternity in hell. They need to hear that God is able to prevail. See, every one of us in here, in one way or another, are dealing with some kind of assault upon our faith. How many know what I'm talking about? You need to know, I need to know, that God will prevail. His Word will prevail. Even when I don't feel like it is. Even when I, I, I convince myself, oh, you know, I, I got all this stuff, I worry about all this stuff. God's Word will prevail. We need to convince ourselves of that and we need to be empowered with that. And oh God, we need your Holy Spirit. Not just a warm, fuzzy feeling, but we need the Spirit of God to come and enter in us and change us. God wants to change us. He wants to conform us to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why the Spirit was given. That's why we're here today. That's why God has us here. That's why God has churches everywhere that are preaching God's Word. See, we're not the only church preaching God's Word. There's lots of pastors preaching God's Word. That's lots of places where the Spirit of God is moving. But God, that we could allow Your Spirit to just move and breathe in our community. I want to see our community made a righteous community. I do. And I want to see folks, listen, I've, I've, I've said this and I've preached this, that when you hear something from God's Word, don't, you know, a lot of times we hear things and we'll say, whoa, you know, that's not for me. Every word of God comes out. See, and we need to pray. And I said, I, what I said from the very beginning, we need to take the lid off. We need to take off whatever restriction we put on. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever He wants to do in our lives. We need to take the lid off and allow God to do what He wants to do. I believe He wants to do great things. I believe He wants to do great things. In your life personally, and in our church, and in our city. You know, sometimes we wait a long time to see and to, what God's going to do. But God will do it. You know, a day, a thousand years is like a day to Him. I haven't waited a thousand years for anything. But I know that how great is our God. I want to ask you this morning, as we prepare to close, if I want to pray. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a lot of people hear that and they get scared. They think it's something spooky. They think it's... Listen, I've shared my testimony before and I'll do it one very quickly. When I first got saved and I walked into a Pentecostal church and I seen that stuff going on, I said, these people are crazy. I went home. I said, Lord, if that's from you... I mean, I, and they were preaching the Word. I walked in, I seen the Spirit move, and then Brother Spencer, he would preach the Word. You know Pastor Spencer, he didn't preach nothing but the Word. He would preach the Word. I went home and I said, and again, I was just maybe saved maybe four or five months, so I was just learning, and I said, Lord, I, said, I prayed, I said, if that's of you, I want it. If it's not of you, I don't want to go back there. That place is not. And, and he filled me with the Holy Ghost. I was laying in bed. I was all by myself. Nobody kind of, you know, casting a spell on me or nothing. I'm just laying there praying, and I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I started speaking in tongues. And there was nobody there to teach me how to do it. I just did it. You know. So you don't have to be in church. Some people think you have to come to church and have people scream at you for half an hour before you start talking. It doesn't have to be that way. It can work that way. But it doesn't have to be that way. I want to pray. I'm not going to ask you to lift your hand up. Wherever you know who you are, I want to pray for anybody in here that says, I, I want the gift of the Spirit. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. I want, to, I want to have the gifts of the Spirit used in me. I want to pray. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, you know who you are. You touch God with me. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we're trusting that you are able to hear and answer our prayers. And Father, I'm, I'm standing up here this morning. I believe, Lord, that you're going to answer my prayer. I'm praying for the people who are sitting in this room right now that might be saying, I want that gift. 
I'm saved. I know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not save me, but I want that gift because I want to see revival in my family. I want to see my life changed. I want to see revival in my city. Father, I want you to, Father, please fill me with your spirit. Conform me to the image of your son. Father, give me the gifts. Use me for your glory. Father, I pray for those ones who are saying that in their hearts this, this morning. God, that you will show yourself faithful. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. And let there be testimonies of your touch upon their lives. In the name of Jesus. Father, I want to pray for everybody in this room. If there's anybody in here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior. There might be one that, that have never called upon the name of the Lord. There might be one that has never believed in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would draw that one. It says, unless you draw them, they won't come. Father, draw that one that needs to be saved into the household of faith, Father. Not to join a church, not to do any of that, but just to call upon the name of the Lord. Get their sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Be cleansed and be changed and be made whole in the name of Jesus. If there's, if there's a person in here that's never been saved, I would like to invite you to come. If there's anybody here that needs to be saved this morning, I would like to invite you to come in the name of Jesus. Sis, me, me, Dave, could you just kind of play something softly while we're praying? Come on, sis. Thank you. If you need to be born again and saved, Father, today is the day of salvation. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know the things that are happening. Father, we know just recently, Father, we've had this terrible tragedy in our city where that officer was, was killed, Father. We don't know if we're going to see tomorrow. We don't know if we'll be here this evening. Only you know the times and the seasons. You know the times of our lives. Father, if there's one person in this place that needs to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, won't you draw them in the name of Jesus? Their sins might be forgiven. They would have a hope of eternity with you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Saints, won't you stand with me? Sis, could you play How Great, How Great Is Our God? Splendor of the King.